from South Carolina and a strong supporter of Ronald Reagan. Good morning, America. Well, good morning, Lee, and good morning, everybody. I'm David Hartman. It's Tuesday, the 15th of July. And tomorrow night, right here in the Joe Louis Arena in Detroit, Michigan, Ronald Reagan will become the Republicans' nominee for the... ...to go down to Washington and Jack Anderson's report. Good morning, Jack. Good morning, Pat. Well, yesterday morning, I predicted that Ronald Reagan would seek Gerald Ford as his running mate. Sources close to Reagan told me that Ford's name topped the list of vice presidential prospects. Well, then yesterday evening, the Reagans paid a courtesy call on the Fords in their suite at Detroit's Plaza Hotel. Well, I'm told the visit was cordial, but that no pitch was made to persuade Ford to join the Reagan ticket. Nevertheless, I'm sticking to my prediction. My sources say that Reagan still hopes to convince Ford to accept the vice presidential nomination. Ford has said he wouldn't take the job, and so far he hasn't been asked. But I'm told he will definitely be sounded out. Now, both uh, Reagan and Ford now live in California, and the Constitution prohibits a president and vice president from the same state. But legal experts believe they can get around the constitutional ban because of Ford's lifelong residency in Michigan. Meanwhile, Reagan has asked half a dozen of his top advisors to submit their final recommendations for the vice presidency. He'll study their suggestions carefully and then narrow the list to no more than three finalists. Reagan won't summon them to his headquarters for a final appraisal, as Jimmy Carter did during the 1976 Democratic Convention. Reagan has told associates privately that he isn't going to run a cattle show. My sources say, meanwhile, that the names of George Bush and Howard Baker have secretly been crossed off the vice presidential list. Well, this leaves Gerald Ford as the only big-name moderate in the running, unless he irrevocably removes himself. I still predict he'll be offered the nomination. And I think the chances are 50-50 that in the heat of the convention fervor, he'll accept. David? The Michigan delegation to this 1980 Republican convention heard a rather impassioned plea to draft Gerald Ford for the number two spot. Channel 7's Ben Marshall has more on that story. Convinced former Governor George Romney attack. urged the Michigan delegation to begin a groundswell movement to get former Will President Gerald Ford to accept the GOP vice presidential nomination. Affairs. He said a Republican victory in November is not a certainty, and the selection of the vice presidential candidate to strengthen the ticket is critical. There isn't any question in my mind but that if the delegates at this convention last night had been free to express themselves, Gerald Ford would have, would have again been nominated to be President of the United States. I make the suggestion that we at least weigh the question of whether or not an expression on our part uh, might ignite a broader expression within this convention uh, to indicate uh, the desire of the delegates to field the strongest possible ticket this fall. And I think we need to do that to, 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 to win. I do not think this is an easy battle. In the past, a lot of candidates have run for office, and in some cases, they have been elected after saying, under no circumstances, would they do it. It could happen again. With the Michigan delegation at the airport Hilton, Ben Marshall, Channel 7 Action News, reporting. Well, it sure would be nice if we could uh, somehow run down Gerald Ford and indeed ask him if Ronald Reagan offered him the vice presidential nomination when the two men met today. Today, Mr. Reagan set out to patch up some cracks in Republican Party unity, specifically over the controversy that has been caused by the Republican Party Platform Committee stand on the ERA. He met today with Republican leaders at the Plaza Hotel. He told a group of ERA supporters that he would not disqualify a potential running mate merely because of the potential running mate was in support of the ERA. And today, Mr. Reagan also worked on getting some Democratic support, which many of the political experts believe he's going to have if he's going to turn out to be a winner in the month of November. Channel 7 Steve Handelsman is at Reagan headquarters with a live action camera report on what's going on there. Steve? Meetings, Bill. Meetings, meetings, meetings. That's what's been happening here in Reagan headquarters. And the people who are staffing those meetings for Ronald Reagan are being driven crazy by the Renaissance Center, our beautiful Renaissance Center. They like the way it looks. It looks. They just don't like getting around here. Those escalators there are, are the problem. All of the people attending meetings with Ronald Reagan have gone up to the 69th floor. They have to be brought down through a special routing set up by the Secret Service, down elevators, through halls, down escalators, through more halls, up through escalators, and down through halls. It's, if it sounds crazy, that's what it is. 
Some of the people in those meetings today were unemployed workers from Flint. At about 3.15, 19 men and women from various Flint unions, some with their wives, sat down with Governor and Mrs. Reagan in the private Reagan suite, 69 floors up in the Plaza Hotel. This was the same group that met with Reagan before he lost the Michigan primary in May. Today, more discussions of unemployment in Flint in Michigan and what to do about it. Reagan had an answer, make changes in Washington, loosen up controls on industry so it can compete better with foreign business. Later, a news conference, the workers spoke. I had no intentions of voting for Mr. Reagan. I went there to tear him apart at the first luncheon and I got a surprise. I got some real direct, good, sound answers that I needed. If you had to vote right now between Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan, who would you pick? Uh, probably neither one. <laughs> Why? <laughs> What's missing in those two men's uh, background or personality? They're concerned about, just like you said, the higher unemployment of black people. That's probably the reason why. Because each of them want the black vote, and they haven't came out and said what they're gonna, really going to do. Ronald Reagan had a suggestion for those 19 workers from Flint, which, if it gets out, might not get him a lot of votes from the head of uh, Michigan unions. He said, you know, there's no recession down in Texas. You might look for a job there. Bill? Steve, did you hear any speculation at all that there was uh, an offer made by Ronald Reagan and Gerald Ford to take the second spot in the ticket? None at all. As a matter of fact, a couple of the national newspapers were uh, prominently displaying headlines today that said George Bush is the number one man. We thought we spotted George Bush when we were up on the 69th floor with that group of Flint workers, but I'm not sure. We certainly didn't see Gerald Ford, haven't seen him all day, and they're keeping things up there very private and very secret. We'll keep yeah. our eyes peeled, though, Bill. I know that if you see him, you'll ask him the question. Oh, Thanks very much, Steve. That. Friendly, courteous, and helpful, but if you are at the wrong place with the wrong credential or none at all, you are stopped. Starts outside the arena in the Kobo complex. Delegates this way, alternates and guests over here. News people, this gate only. Cameras, batteries, radios, briefcases, brown bag lunches. Everything comes off and goes through the x-ray machine, even if you have the right credentials. The Michigan marching band comes in, but only after all the instruments were thoroughly checked. To get uh, down here with our Michigan delegation on the floor with a couple of stops in between that uh, takes a little cardboard, Secret Service, that uh, gets me in the neighborhood, that gets me in the radio TV area, this gets me into the ABC booth, and this hard-to-find item allows me to spend time on the floor. But to uh, sit down and take Ralph Swan's seat, I would need uh, one of those and uh, one of those. That makes him a delegate. Back in the far corners of the arena, there are plain clothes cops on every door, every stairway, every few feet, over a thousand of them here. Somebody watching, checking your every move. Secret Service, bomb-sniffing dogs prowl the hallways. The hot dogs, the buns, the beer is delivered, and it's checked. Everything that comes in here is checked. Uh, most all your packages go through the x-ray equipment, and it's the way it must be done. Prior to the convention, many people were worrying about the fact that what the hell happens in my community with all the policemen downtown? That's not so, because the officers have their leaves canceled. Everybody's on duty, yes, and everybody's sir. doing a 12-hour day. Everybody's doing a 12-hour day, so if you divide it right down the middle, those people in the community are probably getting more, more police service than they ever got before. Inspector Shiner of the department has a very, very simple philosophy. Better way too much than not quite enough. I haven't heard one complaint about the no, way the Detroit don't. police Correct. officers or other security. I, you really have to attribute it to a sense of class and responsibility on their part because the Detroit Police Department and its personnel have obviously been able to bury their labor problems with uh, the Eric Coleman Young and have done a yep. magnificent job for this community and for these Republicans. By the way, not a few dozen. Around us, about a thousand. About a thousand. ABC News has learned that in a meeting with Reagan this afternoon, former President Ford firmly rejected any notion that he might accept the second spot on the GOP ticket and that he recommended George Bush for that job. Reagan later declined to be specific about that conversation or about the pressure that it seemed to build at the convention for choosing Bush for a running mate. Amid the welter of speculation today were reports, however, that Senator Luger of Indiana may be fading from the list of contenders. Reagan spent the day in his hotel, letting convention delegates, party officials, notables, and policy advisors come to him. Thirteen of his domestic and economic advisors assembled at midday, 
Henry Kissinger was there earlier for a private session on foreign policy and later pronounced Reagan's lack of experience in that area no handicap. In many ways, uh, nobody has the, uh, can have the experience before he is in office. Uh, I must say on the basis of my conversation, relatively brief as it was, I nevertheless believe that Governor Reagan has an understanding of the complexities of what we'll be facing him. Kissinger, who has not been the included in Reagan's inner circle of foreign policy advisors, insisted he was not seeking to be included. To further demonstrate concern for the economic problems in the host city for the convention, Reagan met with a group of unemployed auto workers and their wives. In an effort to ease a problem within the convention itself, he also met with a group of women delegates, upset with his opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment. Afterward, the women, while still disagreeing with Reagan, said they were satisfied that he was sensitive to equal rights and that he promised to consider women for high positions, including the Supreme Court. I think that our meeting today certainly will not redress uh, the platform per se, but he showed an openness on the question of the appointment of a woman to the Supreme Court. Reagan wound up his day with a group of black Republicans, saying he wants to offer the poor opportunities, not handouts. But the question in many minds here, as elsewhere today, remains, is yet to be named running mate. Barry Serafin, ABC News, Detroit. This is Susan King. The Reagan youth delegation was chanting the name of the man they seem to think their hero wants for vice president. And George Bush was thumbs up and optimistic. But Bush is denying all reports that he has become the Reagan choice or that the two camps have met. Miss King, there's been no contact. What do you make of it? Uh, nothing. <laughs> Same thing I made of it yesterday. <laughs> there have been informal meetings between Bush and Reagan advisors, and Reagan sources indicate to ABC News that Bush is the choice. His schedule today looked like a teammate trial run. He was out cheerleading for Reagan, meeting with state delegations, including Reagan's home delegation. I don't think countries abroad want to see the United States apologizing for the United States. And I know Governor Reagan doesn't feel this way. Bush was expounding the official Reagan foreign policy line, but many of his phrases sounded like ones from Bush's primary stump speech, now attributed to Reagan. Though he spent months criticizing Reagan for being too simplistic, Bush is willing to stand by the GOP man. I feel very comfortable and enthusiastic about his views on, on foreign policy. If there was doubt before whether Bush could be a salesman for Reagan's policies, both foreign and domestic, after his debut today on the Reagan campaign trail, there is no longer doubt. Bush is showing he's willing to be a super salesman. Susan King, ABC News, Detroit. Throughout the day here in Detroit, in addition to the more or less constant speculating about the number two spot on the ticket, some of the Republicans have devoted considerable time to discussing whether they should or even can bring some of their differences to the convention floor. There were meetings and caucuses all over town. Here's a report from Sam Donaldson. The unquestioning belief in Ronald Reagan, the man and his policies dominated most state caucuses today. With Reagan surrogates such as John Connolly before the Alabama, Florida, and Virginia delegations preaching the message. What does Ronald Reagan propose to do about it? Ronald Reagan proposes to take us back not to the antiquity of inaction, but he proposes to take us back to the policies that made us great to begin with. They were sound then and they're sound now. But in a few delegations, attempts were made to challenge portions of the party platform. In Illinois, they fought over the line which says people should be appointed judges who respect traditional family values and innocent human life. Um, that there's a new test for judges in this country. And the new test is not do you support the United States Constitution? We're going to abolish that. The new test is, are you against abortion? Because if you're not against abortion, you can't be a judge. We reject that. And we, the platform says nothing at all about a litmus test, says nothing at all about abortion. And I think somebody is trying to confuse the issue. These means tests should not creep in to a platform. And I think we should not begin to politicize the selection of federal judges. Is anybody against innocent human life? It's nonsense. And to try to, uh, uh, try to make pneumonia out of a runny nose is silly. And that's what you're doing. The Illinois delegation agreed with that last and soundly turned back the attempt to remove the line on judges from the platform. 
And in New York, they shouted down an effort to put support for the Equal Rights Amendment back in the platform. Tonight, the convention is underway and the platform is being read, and there's now no way that a roll call vote can be demanded. So after the reading is complete, the platform will be adopted. The majority of the delegates here will call that unity. A few will call it a steamroller. Frank? Thank you, Sam. Frank, the fix is in. It's been in for quite some time now. What is probably going to happen when the platform goes to the full convention for approval? There'll be a motion that will come either from Massachusetts or from Hawaii. The Hawaiian uh, motion will simply call for a suspension of the rules, period. The one from Massachusetts, a little more complex, was approved 25 to 14 about an hour ago. It will ask for a roll call vote on the entire platform. Now, why they're going to fail is that you need six states to suspend the rules. That has to be approved by two-thirds of the convention, and that means they just don't have the votes. In addition, I'm having, I have in my hand here something that shows how well the Reagan people were prepared. This says, and this is what Chairman Rhodes will read when and if this arises, the chair has been previously advised this motion was likely to arise and has, an opportun has had an opportunity to examine the rules and precedents on what is admittedly an unusual procedure. The chair is prepared to state how the motion to suspend the rules and amend the report of the Committee on Resolutions will be handled. And then it goes on into more and more language that rather resembles that scene in A Night at the Opera with Groucho and Chico doing the contract, the party of the first part. But the important thing is, I don't think that there are four other states that have a majority to join with Massachusetts and Hawaii to even get to a vote to suspend the... This is the gentleman who... It is in possession of the chair. ...who fought on behalf of ERA last week. John Leopold. But this is not uh, what he's uh, really concerned about right at the moment. Right. 21 members, 21 members of the Massachusetts delegation have signed a petition requesting the roll call and second the motion of the gentleman from Hawaii. That's Republican Congressman Silvio Conti of Massachusetts. But they need more. I would like to inform Massachusetts. the chairman of the delegation from Massachusetts that the request of the delegation from Hawaii was to suspend the rules and has and, and and no request has been made for a roll call vote in the opinion of the chair if such a request were made it would probably have come too late <laughs> does this chairman from of the delegation from massachusetts uh, wish to state that a majority of his delegation favors the resolution to suspend of the delegation of hawaii Mr. Chairman, in all fairness, I can only report what the delegation voted, and, it, the, and the vote was members of the Massachusetts Republican delegation vote to request a chair for a roll call vote on the Republican platform. Seems that Congressman Conte is rushing the script a little bit. He was supposed to wait until this first thing was disallowed. Yeah, they. The, the chairman of the delegation from Massachusetts reports that. A majority of that delegation has not voted to support the resolution of the delegation of Hawaii. Uh, that's really a ruling by John Rhodes. Right, yes. Are there other states seeking recognition for the purpose of supporting the resolution of the delegation from Hawaii? The chair sees no indication that any delegation is seeking recognition and therefore declares that the, re the resolution which would have been offered by the delegation from the state of Hawaii failed. Now, as Sandy Van Oker pointed out to us just a moment ago, we can get to the business of, at hand, and that, of course, is the business of the roll call vote. Here's Sandy Van Oker. Without objection... Uh, I think that what happened here is what's happened throughout the whole week of the platform, what's happened here. The uh, Reagan forces are in total control here. Uh, there was no concert between Hawaii and Massachusetts. They were two separate items, and they were in no way con in concert. And it indicates uh, how well the whips on the floor for the Reagan forces have counted their numbers, have outmaneuvered everyone. And this is just a disparate bunch of people who are trying to get on record through television, if you will, are registering some opposition to the platform so they can take it back to their constituents at home. 
Stepping from the convention floor, correspondent Sam Donaldson, Max Robinson, Lynn Schur, Sander Van Oker. From the podium, James Wooten, with special reports from Barbara Walters. And reporting from the ABC News convention anchor booth in Joe Lewis Arena, correspondents Ted Koppel and Frank Reynolds. And good evening once again from the Joe Lewis Arena here in Detroit. We're set for a big evening of speech making by the Republicans. They've already adopted their platform tonight after a very minor little fracas on the floor. It was uh, not anything that uh, caused even the, the slightest interruption in the uh, proceedings. It was promptly squelched by the convention managers who are the Ronald Reagan forces. It had to do with some of the language in the platform, but it was a lonely battle and it didn't last very long. Now the speeches tonight, the arrival tonight, just a short while ago, of the uh, wife of the candidate, Mrs. Nancy Reagan, and Ted, every eye in the place was turned to that one spot in the hall. It was indeed, and I, I think I would say that, uh, I would say it was the emotional high point of this convention so far. This is the lady they love. They uh, demonstrated, many of them, their love for her four years ago, and there she is now in uh, what seems to be kind of a quiet and reflective mood, but uh, this place went wild just about uh, 10 minutes ago when the lady came in. Uh, she is seated amid luminaries. If that camera can just pull back a little, I think uh, we can identify uh, the wife of the senator from Virginia, Mrs. John Warner, perhaps better known to you as uh, Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, also there is the uh, wife of uh, the former governor of Texas, John, Kenley, uh, John Connolly. And now we'd like you to take a look at uh, that rather emotional moment when Mrs. Reagan entered this hall. Here now, uh, before she has come into full view of the uh, crowd in the convention hall, moving through the corridors. Pete Secchia, the newly elected Michigan National Committeeman, and probably the man here who knows Jerry Ford best, says, because of that constitutional restriction on both candidates living in the same state, for that reason alone, Ford will say no. I know he's a principal man, and he uh, strongly feels that the Constitution of the United States was written for a reason, and for him to move uh, to be a candidate would be circumventing the Constitution. Okay, I understand, but really all that would require would be for Jerry Ford to move literally the day before. You think he wouldn't do that? No, he wouldn't do that. I don't think he'd do that. I think he, he strongly believes in the uh, Constitution, and it's written for a purpose, and I don't think he'd make that move. So you, so you think that as of tonight, if he has been asked again, Jerry Ford is still saying no. Well, why can't Reagan move? Why can't Reagan move? Well, I suppose there's a possibility. My favorite quote of the evening on the little bitty floor fight that didn't amount to anything, Bill McLaughlin says, can't fight a battleship with one or two. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, Sikia thinks it'll be a dark horse, and he thinks it'll be Guy Vanderjack of Michigan. Illinois Congressman Philip Crane, I guess, is out of the running as a presidential candidate. That is for sure, but he is still keeping active. Tonight he was in Detroit trying to drum up political support from people who don't usually vote Republican in this part of the country. Diana Lewis has more on that story. Diana? Okay, thank you, Bill. Philip Crane went to a Teamsters Hall on the near east side and spoke to a small group of laid-off auto workers and others. Most were members of a dissident UAW faction known as the International Society of Skilled Trade. Crane's message was about the natural constituencies of the Republican Party, and he talked about saving the Republic. I think the Republican Party has an opportunity in part created by circumstance, and that is where we can acknowledge that the rank-and-file union man in this country is our natural constituent. The black is our natural constituent. The Hispanic is our natural constituent. You know, there are people who believe in the system. Why, why do people keep running to these shores? For the same reasons our ancestors did. This country still holds out hope. Channel 7's Jack McCarthy was at the session and says the workers in the room were clearly in Philip Crane's corner. Uh, the applause that you can hear behind me now is for a a young congressman from upstate New York, a fellow by the name of Jack Kemp, who was also a pro football player some years ago and played a couple of games for the Detroit Lions. And let's listen now to the conclusion of Congressman Kemp's speech. No, recession is not the cure for inflation any more than inflation is the cure for employment. How many times must Carol Hallett and I say it? If you tax something, you get less of it. If you subsidize something, you get more of it. And in America today, we're taxing work and savings and investment and output, production and excellence 
and subsidizing non-work, debt, consumption, leisure, idleness, and mediocrity, is it any wonder we're getting less of the one and more of the latter? We must reverse this process by restoring opportunity through economic growth once again. We can have full employment without inflation. We can have a rising standard of living. And we can have a strong national defense. The American people know we can because we have done it before in America. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this then is the choice before the American people in 1980. We can have growth, expansion, hope, and opportunity for our nation, our cities, our neighborhoods, and our children. In this kind of an atmosphere, we can live our lives. We can settle our differences calmly and reasonably. Or we can have continued contraction, suffering, austerity, with all of the bitter social divisiveness that these conditions bring. Which will it be? An era of limits or an era of expansion? An era of despair or an era of hope? Not long ago, a reporter asked President Carter's official spokesman, Jody Powell, what a second Carter term in office would be like. Jody Powell replied, another term probably wouldn't be markedly different from the first. Ladies and gentlemen, can you imagine anything more depressing? The next four years must be markedly different, not only for our welfare and our destiny, but for the world. Our nation's defense is the ultimate guarantor of world peace. World peace must not be held hostage by economic and military weakness. But ladies and gentlemen, the world is not ruled by military might, it's ruled by ideas. From the founding of this nation, from the founding of this nation 204 years ago, ideas have been our chief export to the rest of the world. In recent decades, we've been exporting the wrong idea, that somehow government was the source of prosperity. Those who took our advice, especially some of the emerging nations of the third world, found out that it didn't work. The reason, of course, is that progress was not achieved in this country in that way. Our country was built by individuals through enterprise, through labor, through families and communities. It was built from the people up, not from the government down. In the 1980s, as we rediscover this formula for our success, we must remedy the past and once again export the true American idea, not merely because of a desire or a search of random allies, but because we believe in it and because it is the right thing to do. This is the difference between a positive foreign policy and the one we have now, which merely reacts to one disaster after another. <laughs> no other nation in the world faces this opportunity or this responsibility. Two years ago at Harvard, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, if America does not lead the free world, the free world will not have a leader. Ladies and gentlemen, it is equally clear tonight that if the Republican Party does not lead America into the 1980s, America will not have the leadership it deserves. Fellow Republicans, 
Those of you who have just joined us, this is Ted Koppel in Detroit with Frank Reynolds. Those of you who have just joined us on the West Coast, we are waiting for Henry Kissinger's speech, but there is a very forceful speaker on the podium right now, Jack Kemp, a man being highly touted for uh, Vice President of the United States. He is just wrapping up his speech. Let's listen to the end of it. American Renaissance. Thank you very much. Replay of the enthusiastic demonstration for Jack Kent from his supporters to the vice president. There was a very similar scene just before he began when he was introduced. Those Reagan Kent posters that you see being held by some of the convention delegates, they are seated all over this convention. for the first year by Governor Reagan. He's already proposed it. Frank, let's go down to the convention floor now to Lynn Scher. Uh, we are standing here with Richard Rosenbaum, the former New York State Republican chairman and a Rockefeller Republican at that. Uh, can you support Jack Kemp for vice president, and are you? Oh, absolutely. I've been saying that for some time now. That was a dynamic speech by a dynamic man. And I think it's great to see this demonstration all over the hall showing broad-based support. I certainly can support it. That's certainly coming a long way for a Rockefeller Republican like yourself. Well, I think that Kemp is a, an idea whose time has come just like Ronald Reagan's has. I think he appeals to the urban centers. Uh, he's very strong uh, with the ethnic groups around the country. Uh, I see him as a, as a real coming star. Dynamism, brains, a lot on the ball. Could you have said that a couple of years ago about Jack Kemp? Well, I didn't know him as well then. I think he's come up with some good ideas. I think he's innovative, uh, and I see him as a, a highly energized public servant. How about your delegation? Will you take a poll? Have you taken a poll in this delegation, and what is the vote? No, I haven't taken a poll. Uh, the delegation is not committed to any one candidate. I know that there uh, is support in the delegation for other candidates, but there is substantial support for Congressman Kemp. Okay, Dick Rosenbaum, thank you very much. Gentlemen? Thank you, Lynn.